This video is sponsored by Goat Guns, makers of authentic diecast miniature gun models. Diecast models of aircraft and tanks have been around forever, but when I came across Goat Guns' new range of gun models, I was impressed by the idea and the quality of the models. At 1 to 3 scale, each model has detailed working moving parts. When you select and receive your Goat Gun model, you assemble the kit yourself, the parts snap and screw together. Each Goat Gun kit comes with three dummy rounds and makes the perfect interesting desk display. When assembled, I found the models to be reassuringly weighty. With Christmas coming up, they really do make excellent gifts for a perfect desk or man cave setup. Now you too can get your hands on a little bit of history for a fraction of the cost at GoatGuns.com. That's GoatGuns.com. Have a little fun. It's the evening of the 20th of March 2003 the opening hours of Operation Iraqi Freedom. At 10pm local time, a single B-52 Stratofortress arrives above Iraqi positions on the Al-4 Peninsula in the southeast of the country. The B-52 releases 16 1000 pounds JDAMs which devastate pre-sighted enemy trenches and dugouts. Minutes later, eight MH-53M Pavlo 4s approach from the west carrying SEAL Team 3. Royal Marine Commandos and Navy SEALs are to mount a joint Anglo-American assault on Iraqi territory. The coalition assault has got off to what US Central Command nicknames the Running Start. Earlier in the day, CENTCOM Commander Tommy Franks decided to move the land invasion forward to secure Iraq's vulnerable oil infrastructure and prevent Saddam Hussein from waging a scorched earth defence of his country. The US Marine Expeditionary Force and the British 1st Armoured Division will move to capture the Ramila oil fields while combined forces of the coalition nations will assault the Al-4 Peninsula. Meanwhile, 5th Corps under the command of Lieutenant General Scott Wallace has begun its attack on the left flank, advancing out of Kuwait with the 3rd Infantry Division and the 82nd and 101st Airborne Divisions. Wallace's corps represents the main axis of advance. Their main objective for the day is to capture the key Highway 1 bridge and Talil Air Base outside the city of Nasiriya. The Al-4 operation will utilise special forces from most of the coalition partners. 250 Navy SEALs from the United States, a brigade of Royal Marines from the UK and 126 Polish Grom Commandos will work together to seize southern Iraq's oil infrastructure. During Desert Storm, Saddam ordered his forces to set fire to Kuwait's oil facilities, causing a devastating ecological disaster. To prevent history from repeating itself, the SEALs will hit the ground first on the Al-4 Peninsula and establish landing zones before the Royal Marines will follow and push out to secure more objectives. When enemy resistance is suppressed around the landing zones, the Royal Marine Commandos will move to secure the oil facilities and await the arrival of the US 15th Marine Expeditionary Unit, or MEU. The 15th MEU, with its 2,000 men, 4 Abrams tanks, 16 Amtraks and multiple Cobra attack helicopters, has been placed under British command for this operation and will link up with the Special Forces once they have secured their objectives. Meanwhile, the Polish Grom Commandos will storm Iraq's offshore oil platforms before they can be sabotaged. As the helicopters cross Kuwait's Bubian Island, British and American artillery open a sustained barrage on the Al-4 Peninsula. The first Navy SEALs land at the large metering and monitoring station just outside the town of Al-4, guided by a circling AC-130 Spectre gunship, shining an infrared beacon on the target area. Another SEAL team lands at the coastal pipeline stations to the southeast. The Pavlos head back to Kuwait to pick up the first two companies and a support group of Royal Marine 40 Commando. They are soon joined by naval gunfire from Royal Navy frigates HMS Marlborough and Chatham, which bombard Iraqi positions with 4.5-inch shells. The two frigates and the Australian HMAS Anzac are close to the shore in the Qa Abd Allah waterway between Bubian Island and the Alfor Peninsula. Marlborough is so close in, she has only one and a half metres of water under her keel. After quickly loading Bravo and Charlie companies, totalling around 400 Royal Marines at the tactical assembly area, the helicopters take off to head back in, now flying through difficult conditions with swirling dust and bulky night vision goggles obscuring the pilots' views. Inside the Pavlos, 
The commandos are hot and drenched in sweat from the uncomfortable confines. Bravo Company is to assault two pipeline buildings to the southeast of AL-4, which feed oil to offshore shipping terminals. Major Matt Jackson commands Bravo Company and is riding in the cockpit of a Pavlo when he's informed that the three transports carrying his men must go around. The SEALs have encountered resistance and have to clear out the enemy while the British circle above. The helicopters repeat this three more times, adding to the commando's torment. Jaxa later recalled thinking, I don't care whether there's the assembled masses of Genghis Khan, I just want to get off this bloody helicopter. Finally, the task force is given the order to land and the helicopters set down in the desert. The commandos fan out to secure the oil pipelines separated by a mile from each other. Jackson divides his force and orders Royal Marine scouts to seize any buildings they come across, intending to use them as observation posts. His objective is to clear the area and then move out to expand their defensive perimeter. After securing the westerly pipeline, Jackson's men come across an enemy command bunker which has not been seriously damaged by the B-52 raid. The Iraqis inside open fire, forcing the approaching Royal Marines to take cover. Major Jackson radios in support from the orbiting Spectre gunship and other friendly aircraft. The Spectre pounds the target with 40mm and 105mm rounds, throwing clouds of sand into the sky. The bombardment ends a few minutes later when an F-A-18 Hornet screams overhead and drops four guided bombs on the bunker, neutralising the enemy. Major Jackson is satisfied by the display of firepower and decides to hold a defensive position until daybreak. To their northwest, five RAF Chinooks carrying the Royal Marines of Charlie Company and five Pavlos carrying 40 Commandos Maneuver Support Group, or MSG, approach the oil monitoring and metering station. The Maneuver Support Group comprises GPMGs, heavy machine guns, grenade machine guns, and javelin sections. The MSG provides fire support for other marine elements. The commanding officer of 40 Commando, Colonel Gordon Messenger, has accompanied his men to this objective. Charlie Company is to secure the perimeter and support the SEALs already on site, while the MSG will clear the main gate and a security bunker. After being warned about the boggy conditions around the station's perimeter, Messenger decides to make a slight change to the plan and his Chinook lands on the tarmac road running directly through the facility. However, he is then informed that telegraph poles lining the side of the road will have to be felled before the rest of Charlie Company can land. With no saws or large cutting tools, the Royal Marines improvise and place keyhole charges against the poles before detonating them. With the path now clear, the formation of aircraft inserts 200 Royal Marines in three waves in two minutes and the Marines reinforce the SEALs already on the ground. The 35 men of the MSG element of the Marine reinforcement, under the command of Captain Paul Lynch, land 500 metres away from their objective to find that the SEALs had lost their vehicle in the mud and have been unable to secure the outer perimeter as a result. To make matters worse, Captain Lynch had been told to expect around 30 contacts in the trenches to the north of the main gate, only to now be informed that a Spectre gunship is picking up more than 130 on thermal vision. Lynch calls in fire support from the Spectre, which saturates the area with 40mm shells. A Chinook carrying more Royal Marines picks this inopportune time to land right behind Lynch's MSG, drawing fire from the undeterred Iraqi defenders. To cover the helicopter, Captain Lynch sends 10 men forward to secure the gatehouse in a bounding advance. A Royal Marine Corporal asks Lynch if they should fire on any contacts they see on the rooftops. Irritated, Lynch responds, They are the enemy. We are here to kill the enemy. Now get on with it. Lynch orders his men to set up a Milan anti-tank missile launcher along with three machine guns to provide covering fire. He intends to make up for the MSG's numerical disadvantage by showing aggression. The 35-man strong MSG assaults the 130-man strong Iraqi positions, methodically clearing out buildings and trenches near the gatehouse. Lynch's men strictly adhere to the rule of no fire without advancing, no advance without firing, when attacking their numerically superior enemy. Iraqi mortars fire back, forcing the marines to occasionally take cover. However, 
The Milan is also used as an anti-personnel weapon against the mortar positions. Furthermore, most of the enemy troops are demoralised and many throw their hands into the air when Lynch's men draw closer. A company of 40 Commando arrives to reinforce the attack and provides additional fire support. Eventually, the position is secured and the MSG digs in. Neither 40 Commando nor the Navy SEALs suffer any casualties during the operation. At the same time, the US 1st Marine Division under the command of Major General Jim Mattis has been tasked with capturing the Ramila oil fields. Mattis is an aggressive commander with the callsign Chaos and is excited to command the longest marine advance since the 1805 Barbary War. His goal is to seize the key oil installations before turning north to aid the attack on Baghdad. Colonel Joe Dunford's 5th Marine Regimental Combat Team, or RCT, is the first unit to roll across the border. Most of the lanes through the Iraqi minefields have been successfully cleared, allowing for a rapid advance by Lt. Col. Fred Padilla's 1st Battalion. They speed north to capture crucial oil facilities, the men complaining about their bulky mop suits designed to shield them from chemical weapons. Alpha Company of Padilla's Battalion advances in a wedge with a platoon of Abrams leading the way. The Marines encounter two Iraqi tanks in a quarry and the Abrams quickly destroy them before resuming the attack. They meet no more enemy units as they advance. Padilla is pleasantly surprised by the lack of resistance and his men successfully secure gas oil separation plants and pumping stations before setting up defensive positions. Meanwhile, a much larger joint operation is underway. 14 CH-53s and 14 CH-46s, accompanied by 12 Cobras and 4 UH-1 Hueys, will land the 550 Royal Marines of 4-2 Commando at the vital town of Al-4, to the west of 40 Commando's position. The capture of Al-4 will allow the Coalition control over the entrance to both the Euphrates and Tigris rivers. It will be the largest opposed airborne operation since the Vietnam War. At 2.50am, the task force takes off from Kuwait with the Cobras leading the formation. The helicopters are piloted by Americans, who will land the first wave of Royal Marines at their destination before going back to pick up more of 4-2 Commando. Lt. Col. Jerome E. Driscoll is leading the assault flight in Dash 1 when the pilots encounter heavy smoke. Alerted by the earlier fighting, the Iraqis have set oil fires which exacerbate the already difficult flying conditions. The formation is approaching Bubiyan Island at 225 feet above the ground when Driscoll hears frantic shouting in his headset. Dash 3, power, 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 pull up. Driscoll spots a flash of light out of the corner of his eye, followed by another report. Dash 3 is down, there's a bird down, it's in flames. The disoriented crew has flown right into the ground, killing the eight Royal Marines and four American airmen aboard. In light of the worsening conditions, the mission is aborted. The invasion has also started on the left flank. Major General Bluff Blunt's 3rd Infantry Division is tasked with capturing the Highway 1 bridge outside of Nasiriyah, along with the Talil airfield to use as a forward operating base. Iraqi resistance as a whole collapses, but some border outposts offer defiant resistance. An Apache is damaged by small arms fire from one outpost, but the crew is able to return to base. These holdouts are soon identified and silenced by coalition firepower. When the engineers are done clearing a path, they stand on top of the sand berms and wave American flags to signal that the lane is open. The first echelon of the 3rd Infantry Division passes the Iraqi positions, which are now smouldering ruins. As the division vehicles are moving forward through gaps in the sand berms, a recon patrol spots a company of T-72 tanks ahead through their thermal goggles. A task force comprising most of 2nd Battalion of the 7th Regiment opens fire with their Abrams M1A1 tanks and Bradley fighting vehicles and call in air support before they realise the Iraqis are curiously not returning fire. Patrols are sent forward and discover that these are destroyed tanks from the first Gulf War. Their rusting remains have appeared on the thermal cameras after soaking up the desert sun during the day. The advance continues as the 3rd Infantry Division heads north to the Highway 1 bridge. As day breaks, 
Lieutenant Shane Childers' platoon in Alpha Company of Padilla's 1st Marine Battalion 5th Marine Regiment is guarding the road leading to a pumping station when a pickup truck carrying non-uniformed men with AK-47s approaches. The Marines have been told that armed Iraqis might be friendly militia and to hold their fire. The truck pulls up, and the Marines wave only for the men in the back to start shooting. The Marines fire back and all of the enemy fighters are killed, but Lieutenant Childers has been hit and slumps to the ground. The medic immediately goes to work, but it's no use. Lieutenant Shane Childers is the first man of the coalition killed by enemy fire in the Iraq War. 1st Battalion of the 7th Marine Regiment attacked the oil pumping station at Zubaya, which pumps 14% of the world's oil supply to Iraq's port terminals. The pumping station is codenamed the Crown Jewel to underline its importance. Under the command of Lt. Col. Chris Conlin, the Marines assault the complex, expecting a tough fight and anticipating that the Iraqis would blow up the facility at any time. However, they find no defenders, and the workers are still at their posts. Conlin inspects the facility, and sees damage to some of the machinery. He suspects sabotage and confronts the workers, only to be told that the facility is merely in its normal state of disrepair. Iraqi infrastructure is far worse than originally expected. The next objective for the right flank of the invasion force is the port of Umm Qasar. Capturing the port will cut off Iraq from the Persian Gulf and allow humanitarian relief supplies to arrive. Early in the morning of the 21st of March, the US 15th Marine Expeditionary Unit, or MEU, crosses the border into Iraq, covered by a heavy artillery barrage and encounters little resistance. The 15th MEU falls under British 3 Commando, commanded by Brigadier Jim Dutton, who dispatches a convoy of 20 vehicles of the 15th MEU, along with assets from the British 26th Armoured Engineer Squadron, to begin the initial advance down the road to Umm Qasar. As they approach the outskirts of the city, the vehicles come under sporadic small arms fire from Iraqi positions by the roadside. The convoy pushes on until mortar shells start racketing the route, forcing the column to halt. Dutton calls up armoured reinforcements while the Royal Artillery pounds the Iraqi mortar positions. However, the artillery fire comes dangerously close to the vehicles, which hastily withdraw to stay out of the killing zone. Shortly thereafter, the vehicles resume their advance with two Abrams main battle tanks now in the lead, while the Australian frigate HMAS Anzac provides fire support. By the afternoon, the lead units of the 15th MEU arrive into the outskirts of Umm Qasar and split, some elements moving into the Old Town area, and others advancing for the valuable port area. With CIA intelligence that a brigade of T-72 tanks of the Medina Republican Guard Division, as many as 180 tanks, are on their way to Umm Qasar, it is imperative that the Anglo-American force takes the town promptly. As they drive down the streets of the city, Iraqi soldiers occasionally fire back with small arms, but the Marines suffer no casualties. The fight for the Old Town area will continue for four days, the column reaches the port and forces the surrender of 200 Iraqis. Marines raise the American flag over Umm Qasar, only to quickly take it down. Orders from General Franks' headquarters have strictly forbidden any displays which make the coalition forces appear as an occupying army. The supposed brigade of 180 Republican Guard tanks approaching never in fact existed, another coalition intelligence failure in a growing list. The seizing of the oil fields is a strategic success. The 15th MEU links up with the Navy SEALs and Royal Marines on the 21st of March, while the Polish Grom Commandos secure the offshore oil platforms without loss. The Iraqis have been caught off guard and only managed to destroy seven of the more than 1,000 oil wells in the area. Not only has Iraq's fragile oil infrastructure been captured intact, but the foiling of enemy sabotage efforts prevents another ecological disaster in the Persian Gulf. At his headquarters at Camp Doha, General Franks and Ground Commander General Dave McKiernan are pleased with the operation's initial punch. Moving the ground offensive to before the main air campaign has thrown off the Iraqis' defensive strategy, 
and the coalition forces are meeting negligible resistance. The British 1st Armoured Division is about to cut off Basra with the 7th Armoured Brigade, the famed Desert Rats, leading the way. The Marine Expeditionary Force has already begun its northern advance, while 5th Corps' main thrust continues up the Euphrates Tigris Valley. Franks and Defence Secretary Rumsfeld urged their local commanders on, hoping to catch and destroy the vaunted Republican Guard divisions in a repeat of Desert Storm. As night falls on the 21st of March, it is time for the air offensive, A Day, to begin. Thanks again to our patrons who helped to make these videos possible. Your support is the reason we can produce series like this. Welcome to all our new patrons this month, and a special thanks to our patron of the week, Johan Wess, who has been a long-time supporter of the channel. Each week we select our favourite Patreon reactions to shout out. I enjoyed this one this week from Hyperius, who says, Coalition intelligence agencies try not to provide complete BS intelligence challenge. Impossible. If you'd like to join our Patreon and get access to exclusive benefits such as early access to videos ad and sponsor free, we would love to have you as part of our community.